After performing for more than two decades, Hannah Chung claims the podium as her own. At the astonishingly young age of 31, Hannah Chung is emerging as one of the world's most luminous conducting talents. For the past year, she's been music director of the Qatar Philharmonic, as well as principal guest conductor of the Trondheim Symphony Orchestra, and this after a glittering career as a soloist. She started playing the cello at the age of six, and by the age of 12 was performing under the baton of Maestro Rostropovich, the teacher and mentor, having won the prestigious international cello competition that bears his name. I played first round, second round, and the final, and I got the first prize. And unlike so many other young protégés who rose and fell like comets, Hannah Chung continues to be one of the most extraordinary musicians of her time. Moving from the role of solo artist to conductor, she continues to break new ground in a world traditionally dominated by men, and in so doing, making the masculine term maestro gender-free. Hannah Chung, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. To begin with, I should be calling you maestro, but there's no gender-specific term for that. Oh, please call me Hannah. <laughs> But it is interesting, though, that, that a, a term like maestro used to describe the conductor of, of the orchestra. Yeah, for um, a very is long time. Men. It's about men, but you could call me a maestra, I suppose. I mean, the original meaning of maestro perhaps is a, a teacher or somebody who, who sort of instructs and guides. And I attach for myself no particular importance to the title. Why Kato? Why did you come uh, to uh, direct the Kato Orchestra? Well, I was invited, um, offered the music directorship of this orchestra, and I was very much motivated in my decision by the potential of this orchestra, um, by its uniqueness, the fact that we have about 30-something nationalities in the orchestra um, really brings into focus how diverse our musicians are. Their concept of sound, the first memories of music, is very different from musician to musician. And that brings a very complex yet rich concept of sound. And at the same time, you will notice that most of our musicians are from a same generation because the orchestra was created practically from audition at the same time five years ago. The orchestra is five years old. Of course, it's work to make potential into ability, and I'm here to do the best I can t in order to translate um, the orchestra, uh, harness its power. What struck me about the orchestra as well is, is the word youth. Uh, as you said, a young orchestra, yeah. just five years old, yeah. but you yourself seem to have injected yeah. uh, an <laughs> added element <laughs> of, of that youth, of that vibrancy into this ensemble. The orchestra is made of 100 musicians, or more, give or take. So one cannot expect the orchestra of its own volition to do anything, I think, because you've got 100 individual musicians, 100 different heartbeats, 100 different outlook and vision about the piece we're performing. In fact, they only have their own parts on their music stand. So who is there to have the, the, the whole picture? The, the score with everybody's voice running simultaneously. What is the vision? And that's probably the role of the conductor. The conductor is there to sort of um, motivate, also serve, dedicate, um, guide, make the, perf make the best performance come as easily as possible. It's probably the simplest definition of what a conductor does. Um, so, I mean, thank you very much for the compliment. <laughs> no, there has been a marked change in terms of, of, of the way they play and in terms of, above all, the enjoyment that they are bringing to performance. Yeah, that's for me very important, that we enjoy music, that there's passion in it, that music is alive. For me, if you think about it, music is probably the, the most miraculous art because it's about, you control the time when you're listening to slow music or fast music, to put it very simply, your, your concept of time changes. And at the same time, music is very unique because once you create a sound, it dies immediately. You know, it doesn't last. It's not like a painting that's you know, on the wall for hundreds of years. So what we do is we recreate every time a piece of work 
that was written by somebody who lived yesterday or last century or two centuries ago, but it needs to be recreated every single time with new sound, if you will, every single time. And that's the really magic of music and there's joy in creation and joy in sharing this sound that only the people in this room at that moment will share. And this is extremely bonding experience, I think, very personal yet public. Let's just step back a little bit and when did you first know that music was going to be your life, that there wasn't going to be anything else? Oh, <laughs> I don't even have a definite moment. Uh, I'm an only child and my mother is a composer. My father loves music. So they thought, okay, she's an only child. She can have music as a lifelong companion, as a friend. So, I mean, my earliest mo memories are dancing to French chansons and children's songs and, you know, playing on, on the piano. And one day I was listening to Pablo Casals playing the Bach Suite. I think I was five years old at the time. And for me, it was like awakening moment. I cannot believe there's such great, beautiful music in this world. And perhaps it wasn't in that exact words, but the thought, the impression was so strong, even to such a young mind of, of the greatness of, of the wonderful moving quality, the power of music that I, I mean, from that moment, I think it was always going to be something very important, something essential in my life. I never had to make the decision, is it music or something else? It so it was music. Yeah. When did you choose your instrument, the cello, or did the instrument choose you? Yeah, the instrument came to me uh, via my mom. <laughs> I started on the piano. I didn't like it as much as um, I liked it. <laughs> so I told my mom I wasn't enjoying it so much. You know, you've got two hands doing the same thing. The instrument is so big, I can't even reach the ends of the keyboard let alone the pedals, I mean, the most exciting part, no? pedals and the <laughs> hands of the keyboard. So my mom, when I started uh, school, I was like six years old and she chose the cello for me. And I must say it was something completely different. I couldn't even imagine there was an instrument like this. It was a quarter sized cello. So it was about my height at the time. Playing it was wonderful because it was kind of like hugging the instrument. There was this physical intimacy with the instrument, you know, right hand doing something different from the left hand. And best of all, I could carry it around <laughs> everywhere. There's this kind of personal connection to the instrument. So that's how it started. Now, it must have been hours and hours and hours of rehearsal, of practice. Oh, was yes. it always enjoyment? Hours and hours and hours. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, work. <sighs> I think if you know what you want, then it's enjoyable, the process, because once you know you want this sound, I want this passage to sound like this, you know, sadly, plaintively, or so joyfully that everybody's hearts will burst. I mean, it's just you gotta have a vision of what you want, but if you want it, so badly, then I think everybody has the determination and motivation to work for it. And when you get it, that joy, you know, that, that feeling of, wow, I did it, I can do it, that's, you know, cannot compare to anything else in the world. Yeah. Uh, you were 11 when you won the Rostropovich uh, Cello Award and the most prestigious cello award in the world. Um, did you expect that? Were you surprised, say, wow, I've suddenly won something massive? Um, it didn't really sink in, I think, um, at the time. I actually went to Rostropovich competition to play for him. You know, Rostropovich was the greatest cellist of the past century. And uh, there was really no access to him because I was so young, you know, 10 years old, I want to play for Maestro Rostropovich. And, uh, you know, people didn't take me seriously. <laughs> so um, he had a competition in Paris every four years for anybody who was 33 years old or younger at that time. Um, so I sent in my papers, my documents were accepted. I went to Paris, there were 104 cellists in the first round and I remember Slava telling me afterwards, um, he thought the cello was walking up by himself because I was so <laughs> small. He almost had a heart attack. Um, yeah, I just went to play for him and the bonus was getting the first prize and it changed my life. 
Was there a sense of something that you were doing that was extraordinary there? An 11-year-old, you're saying more than 100 other cellists are competing for this prize, many of them um, twice, even more than your age. Was there any sense of, this is special? Not really. Not from my perspective, no. I mean, I love to play and I wanted to play for him. I wanted to hear what he had to say, what kind of advice he could give me. And yeah, I just gave it everything I had. How important was he to your ongoing development as Oh, musician? very important, very important. Um, before I got to know him personally, I would listen to his recordings, of course, as any other cellist would, and hope to imitate the sound he makes. You know, the sound, because music is sound, in a sense. Um, and that was a big, big inspiration for me, is the way he would play, uh, the way he would interpret everything about the playing. And when I got to meet him, finally, I think I kind of found the key to his, his, his music making, and his life was passion. Everything, every day, every moment, 200%, you know. Um, so this forgetting of oneself and giving everything one has is indeed very important. And yet the life of the musician, it, it, passion, yes, but also control. The idea of controlled passion is something that's almost an oxymoron, isn't it? Well, it's always like that. You need, you need law for freedom, that kind of thing. You need structure for, for, for freedom to stand out. For freedom to have any meaning, you need structure. And you look at composers like Beethoven, for example, who you, I just feel his breath down my neck when I listen to his symphonies, like the Third Symphony, Eroica, or the Fifth, or, or the Ninth, you know, uh, you hear something, dun, 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 and it's like, okay, that's Beethoven, <laughs> knocking on my head. <laughs> but at the same time, wow, what mastery of, of structure and form, and what restraint that gives power to his, you know, there's just unbridling of passion. And this is something I think every musician learns almost automatically as he or she masters the instrument because you need to practice. <laughs> it's not going to happen overnight. There are rules to follow, rhythm, pitch. There's absolutely essential that you're specific and accurate. And that's what gives wings to your expression. Without that, you lose everything. Yeah. It's an interesting concept that to get true freedom, you have to get true control. Yeah, but that's absolutely true. Yeah. Was it lonely playing the cello? Were there times when you felt you and your instrument just by yourself? Um, learning the cello, no, it was, I talked to my cello. <laughs> 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 the cello talked back to me. <laughs> it was a mutual, uh, happy, merry-making. Um, but the life of a soloist is very lonely. I found that the life of the soloist, because you're always by yourself, you're fighting yourself, you're battling yourself in your, in your own space with your own instrument. You're responsible for your sound. You present what you think, and that's the scope of the soloist. Of course, there is interaction with your chamber music partners or with the orchestra you play with, but as a soloist, pretty much that's what you do is yours. And I must say that's the biggest change from a soloist to conductor is that as a conductor, you are actually sharing and you give to the orchestra what you think and they give something back to you. And it's something of a, uh, making one vision come alive together with 100 people in front of you. This is a completely different process and something that I enjoy very much, yeah. Was that part of the motive to move to conducting? Um, I wouldn't say that was the motive. I would say that was one of the rewards that I found so fulfilling, yeah. Th there have been many prodigies in, 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 in the music world. It's almost like yeah. a specific type of, of person. Mm -hmm. And yet many prodigies burn mm -hmm. and fall. Mm -hmm. You didn't. You have kept mm. on developing. Is, is there a specific reason? Because very few have, have, have done one, can you know, count them on one hand, those yeah. who stayed and kept a rich yeah. uh, musical life. Well, I, 
for myself, I mean, we, my parents and I, we already always try to limit the number of concerts I would play in a year. I mean, Rostropovich was the first person to tell me this after he gave me the first prize in Paris. He invited me to come to his apartment with my mother and said, you know, now, <laughs> Everybody's gonna ask you to play every single day. Your managers are gonna like, you know, like squeezing an orange juice. That's what he said. You know. Be aware, take your time, go to school, have normal friends who don't have anything to do with music. Don't play more than four concerts a month. And at the time I didn't really realize what he was saying, but I think as I grew up, I kind of, you know, understood what this was about is as with anybody else, prodigies need to develop. They need time to mature. Um, if everybody else is going to university and just because you are a prodigy, you don't have time to go to university, that's unfair for you. You know, it's not to miss out on, on the natural growth, natural maturing process. Um, if anything, a musician should need this more, you know. So for that, I'm very thankful. I mean, it is an element as well in that in order to progress, in order to continue to be vital you had to expand your horizons the move to conducting I'm, I'm, I'm referring to was was there an impulse there to actually I can do the cello I've been doing it a long time I've got to move into something else I've got to have another challenge yeah absolutely absolutely um, the cello repertoire is very small it's incomparable to the number of works written for the piano or even for the violin I mean the cellists have very small number of great masterpieces to perform. So um, I started my professional career at the age of 11. You play the same piece over and over again. And of course, every time you try your best to bring a fresh mind, a fresh set of glasses, so that you are able to find something new about our composition. But at the same time, you need to know what the composer was writing at the same time as this composition. What other compositions did he write? You know, what was on his mind? Um, what was his goals as a musician? You know, what, what, what did he want? What kind of sound did the composer like? And all these questions, I think, sort of culminated in my wish to study the great symphonies, because the orchestra is perhaps the most perfect instrument, if I may call it an instrument, because it has every single instrument. So every kind of sound is possible out of an orchestra. And for a composer to write for an orchestra, for him, this is, you know, the, the chance, the opportunity to, to express everything in his mind in every single conceivable sound, basically. So in the symphonies, I found really that the most important aspect of the composers would be in the symphonies and studying them and then having the wish to perform them myself. So, yeah. Some, some have likened the conductor to a surgeon, to the, with the absolute single-minded focus yeah. that there is, it has been said, there's, there's no democracies in orchestras in the end. In the end, it's the conductor who has yeah. to hold it all. Yeah. Together. Is there an element of, of the desire to control in, in what you do? Once again, moving from a cello to conducting an orchestra, is there perhaps the, the want to have a control over an immediate moment or an immediate period of time? Well, I think control is a very difficult concept because how truly can you control another person? Um, you know, you may insist that they do something, but do you have that person's heart? I think that's the, 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 the greatest conductors had the dedication and the passion of their orchestra. They had the hearts of the musicians. I think that's the most important thing because you want somebody to do something out of their desire to do it. You know, if uh, mere control is, is too strong and at the same time too weak a concept, I think, in, in terms of music making, because there comes a moment in, in, in the absolute center, in the, in, the, in the eye of the storm, for example, you see all that movement on stage, everybody doing something, and there's this great sound coming, but at the center of it, there's this calm connection that the conductor has with the musicians. And we just know we're one, you know, we are one. I, I, I may be in front of them waving my arms around, but they're making the sound. 
So this is a very unique partnership. Yeah. Uh, watching you, you conduct is, is, is fascinating because you're almost like on that podium, you're almost like a caged tiger. <laughs> there, there, there is this, there, there's this absolute vibrancy that, that, that is exuding from you. None of, none of the Bernstein Thank pops, you. but there is this. this I love this, the hops. <laughs> <laughs> but there's this absolute intensity to bring all the musicians in, and, and it's almost as though the barrier in front of the podium is stopping you from jumping <laughs> yeah. into the orchestra. Do you feel like that? Um. Ah, well, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe I'm not in those exact words, but I, I see what you're saying. I, it's so urgent. The urgency for me is that I communicate what I feel and what I see and what I think are the composer's intentions. Um, you know, we're now in the midst of performing Tchaikovsky symphonies, four, five, six, the last three numbered symphonies. And when you read of course, all, some of the musicians would say, oh, it doesn't matter what, what the personal background is, that everything is in the score. But with, ah, with somebody like Tchaikovsky, you need to know, because this guy was writing letters like, I was composing my new symphony in my mind and I wept copiously. I wept copiously. The man put tears into this work. It, every note was painful. Every note was something, a glimmer of hope. There's something in every note, and we want that to be alive, that spirit to be alive in the sound that we create. We want that urgency to be felt by the audience. You know, we're, we're like in the middle, we're like translators. You know, the composers left a great testament, and we want them to hear it. We want to share it with the public because it's so moving. One man's passions, one man's um, pains and hope and, you know, his vision so beautiful and it speaks to every one of us because it is so personal you know so i want that out and we're like investigators you know you know the score is like like a great great book of evidence like a map and we have to gather everything we can and make that come alive because one genius you know spend so many hours like beethoven correcting and correcting and correcting again and Beethoven had on his desk a little memo, you know, I will be a better musician every single day. That God made me to be a better musician. And this kind of dedication, it's very easy for us to lose on stage because we perform and everybody applauds and we think the applause is for us, but it's actually for the composer, you know. So to have this serving the composer mentality, and I try my best to encourage yeah, and urge the musicians to join me. Is it difficult to have a personal life in this chosen career? It's not a career, it is a life. <laughs> <laughs> it never stops. Yeah, um, for me, it's, it's never been, okay, this is what I do, and okay, here's my life. I mean, music is my life, yeah. The Haydn cello yeah, concertos. Wow. I was listening to it yeah. on the way to this interview, and there's, it's quite remarkable, because it struck me the first time I heard it and then listening to it now there's this absolute youthful vibrancy mm -hmm. and sheer excitement mm -hmm. of Thank a teenager you. who's got yeah. the whole world <laughs> ahead of her yeah. do you still feel like that like like I have the whole world ahead of me well I guess I do <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's one uh, one thing that was important for me was that Today is not the highlight of my life. I don't want this to be the high point. I want tomorrow to be the high point. I don't want my 30s to define my life. I want my 40s to define, and then my 50s. And, the, the and I am so fortunate to think this way because that's what music teaches me every day. There's always room for new discovery. There's always room for new improvement. It's not a race to be finished. It's a race to be run, and the more you run, the more you can go. It's kind of like the further you go, the more road opens up, and you go more, and again. You see. So, yeah, it's never-ending discovery. Yeah. Maestro, thank you for talking to our Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.